Okay. Uh, so let's start off. I got some interesting questions. Let me turn this so the light is, is better. Um, sorry about all the jiggling. I'll get settled down here in a second. Uh, so I just worked with, first off, Andy Douglas. I don't think he's going to be on. He wasn't able to be on tonight. But he and I worked on uh, personal instruction on the racetrack uh, just this last uh, weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And he, I, so I basically I answered his question through personal instruction, through actually riding with him and coaching him. Uh, and so the question was, uh, staying ahead, he's wanting to wonder how, wondering how he can stay ahead of the bike in the sense of speed. Uh, I know I have the skills to increase my pace, but I find myself rolling off early than needed and not getting on the throttle when I could because I feel I need the time to process what's happening and what to do next. This is really, really common. Now, he's talking a bit more about sport riding and even racetrack um, sort of riding. And there you're talking about the pace is much more uh, you know, elevated than, than for street riding. So, but it still applies what I'm about to, my answer. And that is that it's vision. It's all about vision. Now, in Andy's case, he had, at one point in his track career, he had too many reference points. Now, we really tout reference points and the importance of them, uh, which on the tra racetrack, they're like cones and we put out Xs. Uh, but out on the street, you know, you have to be looking ahead um, at certain things. A lot of people, well, the MSF, for instance, says look as far ahead as you can. It's not good enough. You have to know what to look for. So this actually segues into another question I had. And uh, so I'll, I'll gang those two together. Uh, and that was from, sorry. Okay, where are your eyes? So Joe, Joe uh, I'm sorry, Jim Morabito asked about, maybe I could show pictures. I do have some pictures here. And talking about well, where to look, uh, where your eyes in a turn. And so that's a big part of, of what answer, answers Andy's question too, is the vision, uh, he ended up with too many reference points at one point, and he's found himself fixating on all these little points uh, and not allowing him, his uh, corner to be fluid. And then the fluidity is something that he was missing. And because he was sort of fo focusing visually and mentally on these reference points, he then struggled with keeping his eyes up and then uh, sort of being uh, ahead of the, of the game. So he found himself behind the eight ball a lot. Uh, so the solution, it was to simplify the reference points that he used. Uh, again, I will relate this more to the street in just a second. So there's, there is uh, such a thing as too much of a good thing. Now, I will say also that whole idea of looking as far ahead as you can, that's also not very helpful when your turn is very tight. If you look too far ahead too early, you could over, oversteer, which oftentimes isn't a big, isn't a big problem. But uh, Janine, my daughter, she crashed uh, at, on the racetrack several years ago uh, because she followed you know, the doctrine of look as far ahead as you can. So she went down into uh, at Loudon, the turn six ball, and she looked way ahead, cranked her head around, and the bike oversteered, and she actually hit the inside of the curbing um, you know, earlier. And, you know, so she turned in more than she should have to... Uh, at, to the apex. So that's one possible, you know, uh, repercussion of that. And I see it oftentimes when I'm working with somebody on the street of the track is that when we start to really get them looking farther through the corner, that they, uh, that they, they oversteer. And so they actually have to adjust how much they counter steer because now they're really getting the power of their eyes uh, involved. So, and even if they start using body position, it all has to be re recalibrated so that you're not oversteering. <clears throat> so, as far as Jim goes, let's go ahead and, and uh, if I share my screen, I will get this Photoshop up. So, I got a few photos here that hopefully you can see. Yep, so I'm sharing. So, here are a few different photos I've got. This guy here, this was in uh, Italy. One thing I want to point out is that I have discovered a uh, little ways after uh, uh, I was there, like maybe I was there a week or so, maybe less, that when I was coaching people, I was coaching this guy, that I discovered that they had put up posts at the perfect delayed apex. And once I discovered that, I was able to really 
uh, visually, and this goes back to the vision, uh, I was able to target those things now as my final destination or my final goal was to get nice and tight where this guy is uh, to that post. And the, interme the time in between also needed a, a couple of little reference points. And let me move to another, uh, another diagram. Uh, nope, didn't mean to do that. Now let's get rid of that. Don't save. All right, this is a, oops, window's closed. Let's go back. So here's the same guy. Now this is a corner that doesn't have one of those posts, like that post would be like right here, but they didn't have it this time. This might've been in, you know, Austria or something. I don't remember. And uh, he ended up running wide here. So you can see that ideally he would be right in here. Now, if you I probably have mentioned it before, but the a really simple way of thinking about uh, where your apex is and a delayed apex is going to be your, your, your primary goal for safety because then you're pointed uh, safely up the straightaway. Um, so if he were right here, see where I am? You can see my line is much more, it's gonna end up right there. And then I'm more safely pointed up the straightaway. He had to make a much larger turn and he's actually pointed more toward the oncoming lane. And so he's gonna actually have to keep his bike leaned a little longer to end up at the same point uh, as me. So that's the advantage of getting your apex in a little tight. Now, the apex itself, where is it located? Well, if you think about a straightaway and every corner dumps out into some kind of straightaway, even if it's uh, a switchback, there's gonna be a little bit of a transition from the left side to the right side. And the apex is almost always just before the straightaway. So right there, that would be your apex. And so you can see that's kind of where I'm headed right there. Um, so what do you look for? Well, that is something you, you ultimately, that's sort of the last, um, uh, what do you call it? The last um, reference, uh, visual target. That's what I'm trying to get at. It's the last visual target. So, um, besides that, I mean, this is going to, I mean, not, I'm going to have to share my screen again. Okay. So, as you go through a corner, though, let's look at this one. This person here coming up the hill is set up, you know, as um, this is also, there's somebody asked about managing downhill hairpins and uphill hairpins, and this I'm going to use this diagram with that as well. Um, the, uh, Find the tool. Sorry, I'm being so clumsy about this. It's my brush tool. All right, this works. Um, that, where do you look? Well, when you're back in here, you need to be looking up to about here. So you can see this person, this is actually Lisa, and this is Mike, and Lisa's looking right up. She's already got her vision about right here. Mike has got his vision about right here. As Lisa gets up to here, her vision is going to go. There's the apex. It's going to go right up to this apex. So if you think about it, and before Mike got here, his vision was going to be here. And then down the road, it was going to be, you know, even earlier. So you can see that there, these would be considered reference points. Um, but there aren't any sort of necessarily marks. So like on the racetrack, we would have a cone. Uh, so where your eyes go is they kind of ratchet through the corner. Now, it's not that you are jerky about it. It ends up being nice and fluid, but you have to, then you get an idea of where you're looking next. So it's an intermediate. So your vision ends up being sort of a wide vision, which is gathering all the information you can, you know, 12 seconds ahead, eight seconds ahead. And then your middle vision, which is going to be for Mike here, it's gonna be more like in this area up here for, and also as he starts to pick up his reference points, that are that are his next reference point, and so that's the middle vision. Close vision is if there was something in the um, in the road that that say Mike had to look at and had to look for and, and sort of double check to make sure that everything was okay. So that's sort of the vision, the, the idea of uh, vision being a ratchet. So your eyes sort of work your way through the corner, uh, with the goal ultimately being the apex, right there again, just before. 
where the corner ends and the straightaway begins, okay? And I'm gonna get rid of all of this. Okay, let me uh, get back. So that's sort of in general, in a uh, one way to look at it is just is to think about your vision more specifically than just this general look as far ahead as you can in the corner. Be specific about where you're looking. And again, there's intermediate, there's, there's far as you approach a corner, you're looking far ahead. You're like trying to gather all the information you can. Uh, as you come toward the corner, your middle, your vision goes middle. And that middle is now uh, going to be like the black dots that were on that, that picture. And so now you're gonna start to be more accurate about where your front wheel is gonna be. Your close vision is going to be uh, when there's something in the road that you need a closer look at. But that should be very minimal. I mean, unless you're in like uh, this crazy pothole riddled uh, road that you really have to, you know, keep your eyes more down. Your vision, typically we live in the, in the wide vision and the middle vision. Uh, but again, be specific as much as you can uh, to what you want to look at, not just looking ahead vaguely. Be specific about it. Uh, okay. Uh, well, let's go. I'm kind of getting out of order of all this, but let's talk about this. Okay. So this is Bob Elder. He was the one who asked about, he says, what skills are needed to ride up and down safely mountain roads and how to practice best uh, those techniques? Someday I'd love to do Mount Washington. That's great. So I have a lot of videos on this and articles about how to survive a hair, hairpin turns. Uh, so go to the website and you'll see those. Go to the YouTube channel. You'll see, see um, specific, uh, I should say, videos and articles specific to this topic. But let me go back to the screen share and let's look at this. Now we'll look at it going up and down. We can use this, uh, this photo to, to do both. Now, trail braking comes into play. When we're going downhill, you must control the effects of gravity. So by braking for the corner, which you know you've got, it's downhill, so you're going to have to brake a little harder, uh, or you have to brake a lot harder than when you're going uphill. See, this is a pretty steep hill. This is in in Italy, and uh, if you were to let go of the brakes, say right here, let's pretend we're in the correct lane, uh, gravity would actually shoot you down off into the pointed down into this area here and so that would be a bad thing so what you do is you hang on to the brakes and you're braking you're braking you're doing most of your braking up here so all these concentrated dots are, are you're slowing but as you get closer to the corner then your your braking gets open it opens up it's lighter and by the time you come around the corner again pretend i don't have this photo showing the full width uh you're off the brakes completely, and then you're starting to transition to the throttle. But you want to hang onto the brakes around the corner until your bike is pointed safely down toward the exit. And if you get let go of the brakes too soon, you're going to have to turn a second time to get yourself pointed down the uh, down the straightaway. All right. So trail braking is an important important um, uh, technique to use with these downhill hairpins. And what I find with most students is that they let go of the brakes too early. And then they end up have finding that their bike goes out here and then they have to struggle to keep it away from the edge of the road. And because they're not really good at this or they haven't practiced it, they do what most nervous riders do is they turn in too soon. And then what happens is you're pointed off that way too. And that's gonna give you trouble. Um, so the idea is that if your line has to be correct, which we haven't even talked about the line yet, so you're just controlling your speed. Your line brings you out and then it hooks you back in. So when it comes to this particular corner going down, your apex is still, see the straightaway? is gonna start here. Your apex is gonna be right before it. So that's what your goal is to hang out wide, hang out wide so that there's your apex and now you're pointed safely down the road. Okay, again, I'm, I'm on the wrong side of the road and all that, but that's just nature of this photo. Sorry about that didn't think I was going to use it for this reason. Okay, so well, let's look at it um, uh, from if, if we were able to go outside, do this, or as far to the right as we can from this photo. All right, we know we're trail breaking around the corner. We're staying wide. So we're all the way out here. Again, we're going down the hill to the left. We're staying wide. 
we're still on the brakes to about right here. Now we're pretty much off the brakes and now we're starting to throttle out. And because I'm all the way out here, my apex is, um, is going to be, so remember that straightaway idea is like right here, but let's stay in our lane. It's gonna be about right there, so just before. So your line goes out, 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 and then it comes in here. Now remember, if there's a car or a truck coming the other way, you can't do that. You have to stay wide, okay? You stay in the middle of your lane and you stay away from, from any uh, hazard that might be here. It's a thing that a lot of people, when they talk about you know, apexing on the inside is that they kind of get freaked out because they think that you know, I'm advocating that you come too close to the oncoming lane and that couldn't be further from the truth. So uh, now coming uphill. All right, so again, vision. We talked a bit about that going down. I'm gonna be looking if I'm going down. I'll be looking here, and then I'll be looking down here. And as I come around, I'll be looking here, and then I'll be looking all the way down the straightaway. So that's about what I would end up doing. There may be one other uh, intermediate um, um, visual target that I would have where I'm starting to turn in. So that would be, a, if you were to break down your reference points to look for, there's sort of a, a breaking area. That's just an area. On the track, it's a point. But on, on the street, it's an area. So it might be this whole area in here. That's your breaking area. Now your trail breaking area is around here. And now this is your, your acceleration area through the rest of the way. Um, so those are, those are reference points to consider when you're out on the street. Um, and think of them more as areas. Now, if you get more specific, that's great because when you come to the apex, you do want to be specific. You know, you want to really get in there and, and get yourself pointed uh, as safely as you can down the straightaway. Okay, let's see, I think I've got another photo. Amazing. That, that, share my screen again. And I've got another photo. Okay, so here's, this is a, uh, I believe it's the Blue Ridge Parkway. So what we have here is where do you look and where do you set yourself up? Now I talked a bit about the corner lines. You can see the sign right here, 15 miles an hour. Okay, and down there you should you should respect those speed limits. Um, so where do you look? Well, first of all, you're coming down here. You can see here because we talked about reading the road before, the guardrail, the tree line, the angle of the painted lines, which you can barely see in this photo, and then the guardrail. Uh, the back side of the guardrail as you're approaching it from this direction. So your line would be out here. It would start to come in as long as nobody's there. You would start to come over to the yellow line and that would set you up to go around the corner. Okay, so that's your, that would be the, the, the line. Now, how do you set yourself up for that? Well, you're looking way ahead and you're looking at all these points. Like I just mentioned, the trees, this little tunnel of trees, you know, that it goes around this cliff, the guardrail, all this stuff is going to give you the clues you need and that's what you look at when you are um, when you're um, try approaching a corner. Now you can say, well, I can't see around the corner. It's a blind turn, well, how do I know? You have to actually train yourself to visualize what you can't see. So as you approach this, you're gonna get more information. So right here, it's pretty blind, but you can get a rough idea about how that corner is gonna finish. It's gonna come off somehow this way. Now what it does after that, I don't know but we're gonna get ourselves set up wide so we get as good a look around the corner as we can. And then it might switch back, we don't know, but we'll, as we get closer, we'll have a better idea of that. Uh, so again, vision has to be way ahead. Now, big vision, like I talked about, is all this. You see this before you ever need to see it, okay? Your middle vision is going to be this area in here. All right, so now you're being more specific about where you want your bike to be. Okay, and then close vision is like, hey, what's this stuff in, in the pavement? Okay, so that's sort of the big deal here. Okay, Peter, can you please discuss the overlap, uh, if any, between trail braking area and throttle area? In other words, rolling on any throttle uh, while still tapering off the trail braking. Yes, so we work on that a lot on the racetrack, and I work on it a lot with my street students. That um, what it is, let me go ahead and stop sharing this. Uh, what it is is that you want to be as smooth as you can so that when you are transitioning from the brakes to the throttle that you're not causing the bike to pogo. So uh, if you think about trail braking as, you know, it's braking into a corner and you're doing still more than, you know, 90% of your braking is done straight up and down. 
So all you're doing is tapering off the brakes at last 10% as you increase your lean angle. Okay, so you're coming in, slow down, you're hanging onto the brakes as you tip in, and now you're off the brakes and you're on the throttle. So that transition period in between the brakes and the throttle, that's, the, uh, that's what Peter's asking about. So to be as smooth as you can, you, uh, you can brake, and I use two fingers to brake, and just because you know, for emergency braking, ideally it would do four, but for general cornering, you know, not, you know, planned cornering, two finger braking allows me to then uh, have you know, my thumb and these two fingers on the throttle. So what it does is when I reach for the throttle, I reach and I curl my fingers. That's how I apply the brakes. And I actually do it, I apply the brakes before I fully shut off the throttle. Now it's just a nice smooth transition. You kind of like think about, you know, curves of, of two you know, things and that instead of them being two binary things, they kind of merge smoothly together. Uh, and same thing, what Peter's talking about is when you transition off the, the brakes and onto the throttle. So how that happens is you're braking, you're off the throttle fully because at this point you're slowing, you're, you're just making that smooth transition from throttle to brakes. Now you got to make the, the transition from brakes to throttle. So you're braking and now before you release the brakes, you're actually going to start to pull on the throttle a little bit. And as you do that, you, you now sm smoothly release the brake lever. And so what you're doing again is you're just making it so that it's not going to be jerky. Uh, and it takes some practice, but it's really, once you do it, just do it in the parking lot first. And I have students do it um, just going straight in a straight line in a parking lot. Uh, if it's a big parking lot, you can do it maybe three or four times that you just go uh, speed up, slow, transition, speed up, slow, transition, speed up, slow, et cetera. And that's just going in a straight line back and forth. And then you tr do it into a corner and then it's, it's, that's how you practice doing that. Uh, it's gonna make it so that it's as smooth as you possibly can be when you're transitioning, uh, which is great like in the rain and that sort of thing. You wanna be just absolutely as smooth as you can. Uh, Alan says, Alan Robinson, I find that I'm slowing down too much before reaching the corner, so I'm not carrying speed into the corner. Is it beneficial to practice trail braking on a straight road first so that the timing can be figured out? Uh, and I just answered it as I hit the key, the uh, enter key, yeah. Okay, I'm glad, I, glad you saw that I answered that. Yeah, um, for the practice of that, do it straight up and down, you know, and then just all you're doing is adding uh, uh, the cornering. Um, trail breaking is something you should be doing. Like, it's not, every corner is not a trail breaking corner, but you find opportunities to trail break. Um, who was it? Uh, mentioned going to, yeah, Bob, mentioned going to Mount Washington. I always bring my students up to Mount uh, Greylock. And for that reason, because it's, it's close to the Alps as we've got around here, and there's a lot of downhill hairpins, and it's great for practicing trail braking because you're going slow. Uh, if you're if you uh, are on a road that's really not all that twisty, you kind of have to pick up your speed a little bit to make trail braking make sense. Uh, otherwise, you could end up over slowing, and that's a whole other conversation. I could do a whole thing on trail braking, which I'll probably do at some point. Um, so the key though, let me just do the takeaway, the, uh, the summary is downhill hairpins, trail break. Vision we talked about, uphill hairpins we haven't even mentioned yet. As you come uphill, um, well, we, talk, we talked about the, where, where you look going uphill. But as you go uphill, uh, gravity is gonna slow you down uh, mostly. Again, depending on your speed, uh, but in depending on how steep the hill is. So deceleration only is, is probably what you're gonna need most times like that. And, but if you were to approach it fast, and now you could trail break in an uphill turn too, uh, but now your transition to the throttle, just how I talked about, even if it's from deceleration, you wanna be as smooth as you can to go to, to acceleration, even if you're not braking. So it's, you're off the throttle, and at the same time, we talked a bit before about timing and intensity, the timing of your throttle and how quickly you turn it on is, is going to affect the line at the exit of the corner. If you get on the gas too early and you get on the gas too hard, you're going to have to struggle to stay in your lane uh, or on the road, uh, on, in your lane either way, uh, not, not hitting a guardrail, not going to an oncoming into the oncoming lane. Uh, uh, so that's so for uphill. It's again you, the vision is as I mentioned, you know, kind of ratchet your eyes through the turn. With the uphill, you got your key there is to get yourself leaned in tight, especially for right hand turns because that's a tight turn. Uh, that you have to look up the hill. You got to get the thing leaned, but you don't. You can't turn in too early. You have to come out and around, and so that you hit that uh, the apex, which remembers around the corner, just before the the end of the corner, at the beginning of the straightaway. 
the part where the corner ends and there's a little straight. All right. Uh, let's see, Peter. Okay, great. That's what I'd suspected, but wasn't sure if you uh, encouraged overlap for chassis stability, smoothness, non-abrupt weight transfer. Thank you. Yes, for all those reasons. Because if you think about it, now here's my thing about trail braking that I'll hit anyhow, is that if you, when you brake, your suspension, this is my front wheel here, uh, suspension compresses when you brake, even if you decelerate. Okay, when you turn in, you're actually, you're, um, when you release the brakes, hang on, so you're braking, uh, nose dives. You get off the brakes, the nose comes back up, it rebounds. You t turn into a turn, uh, the corner and it, every, your suspension squats again against the lateral forces. And then you get on the gas. If, if all these things were separate, you get on the gas, now the uh, suspension is going to rebound again. So that's four events. It's, it, you compress the suspension, uh, you've released the brakes, it extends the suspension, you lean in and it compresses the suspension again. You get on the gas, it, it ex extends them or rebounds the uh, suspension. So to eliminate that, you can hold the brakes. That's what trail braking does. So you brake, it noses the, the front wheel down, the suspension, and while you're holding that front wheel down or the suspension down, compressed, you then lean in. And now you've eliminated that one, that one little pogo. Now as you're leaned in, all you're now going to do is you're going to accelerate out as you release the brakes and you've got one extension. So that's making it as smooth as you possibly can be. And stability, your chassis stable, you're managing your traction as, as, as really the best you can. So it's, it's really, that's why trail braking is so awesome. But like I say, a lot of corners aren't really, you're not in, on the street, you're really not, um, not going fast enough to really, for trail braking to make a, that much sense. Um, but it's something you really want to practice. So find opportunities to do it. Uh, also, I mentioned before in another webinar about uh, when you're going like downhill hairpins, uh, uh, choose a higher gear so that you need to use your brakes and that you're not just relying on engine braking. Again, this is for training. If you never trail brake, you, you will never be good at trail braking. So find opportunities to do that. Okay, let's move on here. Uh, so with Andy's question, it's really about vision. It's about keeping your eyes up. Uh, the farther ahead you look, the slower the landscape is. You know, again, I always sort of talk about it as when you're a kid, you'd stick your head out the, the car window and you'd look at the dashed lines in the middle of the road and they'd be like zipping by, boom, 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 boom. But you look up and they come at you uh, slowly. So it's the same concept that farther ahead you look, the landscape slows down. There's less likely a sense of, of you're going too fast, you know, and then panic sets in. Uh, so vision up for that reason alone. And then also, of course, to get the big vision and then your middle vision, big vision, middle vision, middle vision, big vision, close if you need to, middle, big. Your eyes are constantly, and your mind is constantly gathering all this information from those sources, large, big, middle, and then close when necessary. Okay, and when that happens, then you can get on the gas earlier at the right time. If you're looking at your front wheel, you're, you're always going to be behind the eight ball. You're always going to be unsure about, whether, what, about the timing uh, of, your, uh, of your throttle and the intensity of it and the brakes, same thing. So vision, it guides you. Your vision guides you. Uh, and knowing and understanding where you want your bike to be, put it there. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's in the middle of vision, knowing where you want your front wheel to be and then put it there and then reinforce it by getting it right every time. Uh, okay, uh, Dick Burdick, uh, this is interesting. I'll, I'll hit this later. Kyle Saltzman, Kyle and I talked a little bit before uh, about a pretty heady topic and it was about crashing and sort of how do you overcome that? Uh, I've written about that and I think I've got an article after the crash, I think is on my website. And Pretty sure it appeared in Motorcyclist. It is a tough one. Now, luckily, I haven't had a lot of crashes, um, even on the racetrack. So I do know I have, so I have enough experience to, to be able to answer this. But I have even more experience uh, talking to people about their instances and their struggles. And so in Kyle's situation here, he had a, a really a pretty bad crash. And now he's coming back. He really wants to ride. He really, you know, that's the first question is that oftentimes people will crash and they feel like it was, you know, nothing they could do, motorcycling's dangerous, and then sell the bike. All right, so that's what a lot of people do. Um, and they never really 
pursue the fact that you know they had they could have prevented it or that there were things they could have done maybe um uh oh yeah chris chris pippen talked about i'm backing up just a little bit i just saw his thing about using the rear brake that's a really key thing about going downhill hairpins okay let me back up now to uh the crashing so when you crash you're gonna it's gonna get under your skin some more than others uh there have been some instances i've had that uh that kind of stuck with me a little while but not too long because I figured them out I figured out what I did wrong and uh, it was me who did something wrong even when there were things that a lot of people might say well there's nothing I could do it's not true sometimes it is don't get me wrong you know, crap happens but in my case I was able to look back on it and say all right well next time I'm going to do this and so then I can go back out and be, feel pretty confident that I won't get into that s situation again uh, or at least not have it be as you know as uh, close of a call as it was. Um, so I, I I go out there with some confidence. Now, if you don't know how to you know evaluate what happened, that becomes a lot harder. And that uh, that's where kind of getting some help from from somebody like me is helpful. Uh, but also just to, you know ask around, talk to your friends. And but one of the worst things you can do is is just throw your hands up. I mean, unless you just don't want to ride, in which case, throw your hands up, sell your bike, and go off and play golf. And that's, that is the appropriate thing for a lot of people to do because they're not willing to put in, put in the effort and the thinking that it takes to really be a safe rider. Um, so if in Kyle's case, he's absolutely he's a really smart guy. He's, he, he and I have been talking. Uh, he pays attention. He's been, he's, uh, he knows this stuff. And, but still, he has anxiety about how to get back out there. And so some of the, the, uh, the answers I had about that was just that, um, that be the best rider you can be and figure out what, what happened. If it's a specific in incident, then figure out what, what you could have done different. Uh, if it's something you couldn't have done any different, then well, look again, because there are things oftentimes it's like, well, that guy pulled out in front of me and I had nothing to do. Now, sometimes that happens, don't get me wrong. But a lot of times it's like, no, there were clues and you just missed them. You know, uh, like the driver who just starts to move his, his steering wheel like that and, and the head oftentimes turns with it. You have to look for that. And again, like going back to the cornering, it's not just good enough to like look ahead or like make eye contact. And, you know, you gotta know what to look for. The top of a front wheel, that's, that's as soon as that spoke moves, you know that car is moving, it's your first indicator. So those are examples. Um, so, but there's a, there's a more s uh, significant thing that Kyle was asking about, and that was the uh, cause and effects about like what happens when you, uh, uh, when you've got family members who are like, all right, I don't want you on a motorcycle anymore. You scared the crap out of us. We've got kids, you, you know, what are you thinking? Hang it up, sell your bike, We're, you're out of here. Uh, well, you know, uh, Kyle's wondering about that. I think his, his wife is, is on the fence about it. I don't remember that, but that uh, the only thing I can say about that is is that you promise that you will be the best rider you can possibly be, and to give yourself and your loved one uh, literally a punch list of things that you are going to do to make yourself as safe as you can be out on the on, on the road, uh, and it can be upgrading your gear, um, more visibility. Uh, you know, auxiliary lights, all the things you can do. Uh, now, the big thing, of course, is training. And you'd say, well, I've done track days and I've trained with Ken and, you know, I've read books and I've done all this other stuff. What else is there to do? Uh, bone up. There's more you can do. There's always more you can do. I mean, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years and I still look for opportunities to learn. And I am like, sometimes I pick things up and I go, wow, I didn't really, never thought of it that way. So never th th think that there's not anything else that you can, uh, can do to make yourself a safer rider. So, and then if you can list those things down and, and promise you know, your loved one that you're gonna pursue these things, uh, then maybe, th you know, if I were that spouse, then I might go, well, okay, I guess, you know, but I'm still not happy about this. And that person won't really know the significance of say, uh, you know, upgrading your gear, uh, or although that should be make some sense, get a you know better you know air vest and uh, high vis jacket and you know things that you can really uh, protect yourself in case something does happen. Um, so, 
that's sort of the thing about that. I know that there's a few other things that I that I've written about about that. Um, so I think that's how I'm going to cover that. And if there's any other questions about it, shoot them to me. Uh, yeah. So let's go to. I'm going to save Dix for last. What would you recommend? This is uh, Bastian. Um, he asks, what would you recommend for someone getting into ADV riding, primarily on road to start with, while on a budget and allowing good passenger comfort and why? So I'm going to kind of um, assume that there's, that, that Bastian, that you maybe don't have an ADV bike yet. Um, maybe you do. If what I have is a Tiger 800. Now I hear the Tiger 900 is even more amazing, but I love that bike and I can take it really off-road in places I probably shouldn't, and it travels. I could take it across the country like tomorrow. And Carolyn's been on the back for a lot of miles, and it's got a great seat. And I've got luggage for it. Uh, you know, it's just a great option. And they're not very expensive really now. You buy a used one. And it comes with ABS and all that stuff. That's one option. Now you're talking about passenger comfort. There are other bikes that for ADV riding, you know, the, the BMWs, the GS, you can't go wrong with that. I've spent, Carolyn and I have spent a lot of two up riding in Europe uh, on the R1200 GS. And it's a great bike, really is. Um, but BMWs can be a little quirky and they're expensive and they tend to be kind of pricey to, to maintain. Um, not always, but you, know, you BMW folks don't get too cranky about it. They, but there's enough you know, issues that I've seen with them that it kind of makes it in same with triumphs but it kind of makes a, a japanese option you know even you know if reliability is is really really important i work on my own bike so i can go either way with it but the uh, i rode a honda africa twin uh, which is an adv bike and that's also going to be quite similar to the uh, to the tiger um and it, it's a little more vanilla feeling to me but uh but it's a really great bike another great option and you buy these used now and they're they're really terrific motorcycles so, and what do you do about that? Well, if you're a street rider and you wanna do some ADV and off-road, you really do need to give yourself some, some training. And what I mean by that is uh, what I do is I just bring street riders who just got a, a new ADV bike and I bring them out onto the, uh, on, into the forest roads that I have right around me. And depending on how game you are, I bring you into some harder stuff just to get you, give it a taste, you know, of just what the bike is capable of doing. and. And, but before we ever do that, we go to the parking lot and we learn the techniques for off-road riding and for um, you know, body position and, uh, uh, and just talking about traction management, which is a, a big deal when it comes to being off-road because unlike the pavement, traction is quite variable um, when you're off-road. So that's that. Um, Anthony Marino, he asked about fear of cornering and ending up being the cause of some accidents because of it. So fear of cornering, that's sort of the number one reason that people get into trouble in corners is that they don't know how to corner or that and we're assuming they don't know how to corner because they have fear of, fear of it. Um, this is a big question. It's really, I've done a couple of webinars on cornering and that would be the thing I would point you back to instead of re rehashing it here. Uh, of uh, cornering technique. Um, but I covered a few of the things now uh, t tonight, which is vision, huge, knowing where you want your bike to be, your cornering line, using braking appropriately, knowing that you have time to slow down. Um, and again, keeping those the eyes up so that you don't get taken by surprise. <clears throat> and then if there's a leaning issue, because we all have a lean angle limit, that's something that you have to also address and go to a parking lot and lean the bike farther than you have before, clean parking lot with all your gear on. Uh, because you have to trust that you can lean the motorcycle that the tires will stick. If you've never leaned past, you know, 30, well, 20 degrees uh, of lean angle and you need 40 degrees to get around the corner, you're not gonna likely do it. You're gonna panic and you're gonna break and you're gonna fall down or go in the oncoming lane. So you've gotta kind of preemptively train yourself for this. And that's how you get over the fear of cornering. And then you practice. And I will say, uh, this is the opportunity for a track day. You're gonna get a lot of very concentrated cornering practice, also breaking practice uh, on a track day. We have one coming up September 7th and there's still space available, non-sport bike day even. We have regular track days all, all the time. Um, you can email me if you question that or go to the website, there's track days in the menu. 
So the uh, um, so that's going to be the thing to really get you beyond that. So first off is knowledge, but you have to be able to apply that knowledge. And again, track day is very concentrated, and it will make you a better rider. That's just I will guarantee you that. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, okay, uh, Laura. All right, I think it was Laura. Uh, she asked about. No, she asked about something else. Can you talk about road surface and how does it uh, impact how you ride? Wet tar snakes, uh, wet tar snakes, milled pavement, etc. She says you don't need to talk about grass clippings. That's funny. If anybody knows about that, there's been a lot of things about the dangers of grass clippings in the road. Well, usually they show you know from people mowing. Anyhow, it's kind of silly. Yes, you don't corner over things that are slippery. You know, but mostly they go straight over them. Uh, so, how do I deal with that? Is I'm, my vision, like I talked about before, big vision is going to give me a lot of information. Middle vision is going to start to alert me of something in the road, like you know, a stain or a crack or something like that. Uh, so that middle vision is going to start to alert me. It's like, oh, what is that? And as I get a little closer, then my vision comes down a little bit, never close to me, because what you know, at the speed you're going, that you're already there. You can't do anything about it. So your close vision, the faster you go, is quite a ways out still. Um, so I see that, and then I, I, I'm already making a plan about whether I need to go around it, uh, whether I can go over it. If I do have to go over it and I can't avoid it, um, if it's an obstacle, let's say a four by four on the road or something I have to go over, I, I gas it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's against sort of against your nature to do that. When you're about to hit an obstacle, but you want to lighten, you want to extend your suspension. So you want to lighten that front wheel so that it'll, it'll go over the uh, obstacle easier. If you break into the obstacle, that's what's going to cause your front wheel to lose traction. So you want to actually kind of almost like wheelie over it, not wheelie, you're not going to wheelie, but you just extend that suspension and then that, that front fork can absorb that impact. Um, so that's if you have to go over something, but it's also something like if you're going over a lot of potholes, weight your foot pegs, then your legs become a second set of, of shock absorbers. And now your chassis is more stable. So you're not, your whole body weight is not, you know, being hammered into the seat and into the chassis. Um, when it comes to like tar snakes and, and I, I have a video about riding in the rain uh, on, in corners, cornering in the rain, uh, go see that as far as the rain topic goes. Uh, rain riding is, is the same as dry riding, except you have to be, give yourself more of a margin. You have about 80% of the uh, traction you, that you do in the rain, but it's more variable. Like you can have really good traction right here and you can have half the traction 15 feet ahead of you uh, be, just because the surface changed. Uh, like, so that, but in the dry, it doesn't change that dramatically. So you have to have your eyes even farther ahead so that you're not doing anything dramatic. Like when you're entering a turn or you know, if you have to grab the brakes hard, you really want to avoid that um, in, the, in the wet. Uh, so preemptively start applying the brakes smoothly and earlier. That's how you would handle that. It's all about traction management. Uh, tar snakes. Tar snakes can be a little wiggy. You know, they can you know, really make you feel like you're about to slide out. And I have crashed on a tar snake once, but I was dragging my knee in a parking lot. And the only reason I crashed was because my front wheel followed along the tar snake instead of crossing it. Every, I crossed it many, many times that day. I was practicing my body position and I crossed it many times, no problem. But, you know, the bike kind of just does that. But when it did this, it had enough time to actually uh, you know, squirm and slide out. So typically uh, tar snakes, if they go um, perpendicular to your, uh, to your path of travel, yeah, that's where you don't wanna break over them or anything. That's where, cause you're not gonna have the traction that you want. Uh, it's really when they're dry and it's like 50, 60 degrees out, they're really not a big deal. It's when they're hot and they're gooey or when they're wet, uh, that's when you're gonna have some traction issues. So you're always trying to place your front wheel, that contact patch, you wanna be really, really good about knowing exactly where to put it. You put it in the places where you've got good traction. If you have to break over it, same as in the wet. You do it gradually, you do it early. Um, traction with the throttle, same thing. Uh, they're going to wiggle around, you know, and I understand. I get me sometimes too, but understand that if you're crossing, if you're pretty much crossing it, it's going to wiggle a little bit, but you're, run, you're suddenly on good pavement again, and it's, you know, the tire's going to hook right up. So usually not a big deal. Uh, 
milled pavement. So that's something that, you know, they oftentimes put up those signs, motorcyclists be careful because milled surface, it's, it's just a textured surface. You know, if you think about riding off-road, you know, off-road is, is way rougher than that and a lot more variable when it comes to the uh, to tractions. And I do 40 miles an hour on the dirt road easy. So depending on the dirt road. Uh, so it's really not a, a big deal. However, think about the, uh, the contact that you get on a non-milled surface versus a milled surface, you, you've got a lot of voids that the, 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 like the tire isn't going to reach into it. So the voids are, are, are the uh, contacts much more on the top of, of, um, of that milled surface. So the amount of traction you have overall might be reduced some. Same thing as when the wet or anything else is just do everything more softly, okay? All right, talked about Bob's. Oh, Dave, he talked, said traveling with co during COVID. Well, I've done a little bit of traveling with COVID. I'm gonna do more next week. I'm going on a week long um, camping trip with uh, Tony and we'll be in, we're sticking in New England. So there's one of my answers is, you know, stick in your region and then uh, that's gonna help a lot. Um, if, uh, if we were to travel outside, you know, then things get a little bit wiggier, but because we're in the Northeast, you know, Massachusetts, we're kind of in these lower um, risk states, at least in the, for the moment. Um, but you have to have a mask. I always have either a, a you know, a neck warmer, got a Seno neck warmer that I put in. So it's always there. Of course, on a hot day, that's no good. So I, I just have my, my mask right in my tank bag. You know, just always remember to bring it in uh, to any store. I have been finding places um, around me that serve sandwiches and you can even sitting inside and there are only a couple of places I'll really go to sit inside and they have really big inside areas like really tall ceilings um, and but anytime I can get outside seating I do that we just Carol and I just came back from the Cape and we had we found plenty of places uh, sitting outside and it was, it was just fine uh, so I don't know if there's more about that I suppose people can kind of chime in about it uh, Okay, so let's see. Uh, a couple other things. Chris Pippen, he mentioned the thing about the rear brake on, you know, cornering. Absolutely, rear brake is a really great tool. Something that uh, I've re read about, uh, written about, and I am going to do a webinar on that, uh, specifically on which brake when. Um, use every ride as practice. Excellent, Chris. You are the man. Uh, he speaks to himself constantly using my guidance. Well, thanks. I'm glad uh, sometimes I'm in the head of people that I've worked with. Okay, looking forward to that on September 3rd. Okay, September 3rd? September 7th is the non-sport bike day, so I'm not sure which one you're talking about, but cool. And Chris Pippen, oil and rain. So here's one thing, last thing I will mention about the surface is if you got oil or diesel or um, uh, antifreeze, very slippery. Diesel you can oftentimes smell, not always. If you smell diesel, boom, you should have your red alert, and you really got to be on top of that. You may not see it, but if you can smell it, then that's a real sign. You can't always do that. Um, but understand that um, there's usually, usually a better place to put your front tire than over a dark stain or a glossy uh, sur surface. One of the things that you can determine about a surface that, that's gonna maybe change uh, traction is its color and texture. Okay, Those, that's what you're looking for. Again, you see how specific it is about what you're looking for? It's not just, it's not good enough that to just look for oil. You're looking for a change in color and texture. Okay, and even shape, you know. Uh, okay, Peter, you were discussing working on new ADV riders uh, on their skills earlier. Our one-on-one -on -one off-road training is not three. Perfect, okay, Peter, sorry. I did forget uh, that, yeah, we're doing off-road uh, training. Uh, Peter and I, um, that's gonna be fun. I really enjoy the off-road training. It's a blast. Okay, thanks for that reminder, Peter. Let's see, a couple others. We're about at almost an hour, so let me move on here. Uh, Sharon McCarthy, she asked about her hand, throttle hand um, going numb. She asked that on, a, on a, another webinar earlier. Uh, I, there are grips that you can use, and I, maybe I think she's tried a few. There are barrel grips that my wife really likes, so they're shaped like, like a barrel, you know, like, uh, so they're, Shape, shape narrow and then they go wide and they go narrow again. 
it sort of makes it so that your hand is naturally fits in there. Try those. They're not, they're not great in as far as like the, what they make them out of, but there's that. Um, uh, gel, yeah, I haven't found those to be all that much better, but you know, anything you can try. Bar end weights, if you can add heavier bar end weights for vibration, that's a, that's a fix. Because bar end weights, that's why they're there, is they quell vibration, they change the frequency of the vibration. So try that. There are places that you can get heavier bar end weights for your bike. Um, the other thing is I do have a throttle lock. Well, actually, my Tiger now has a um, cruise control, so it's electronic. But before that, I had a uh, throttle meister, and so it was able to lock the throttle. And you know that's not great because neither is um, is uh, cruise control when you're doing anything other than just highway. But it gives you you know some sort of uh, opportunity to, to take a break. And even like if I'm going through some twisties and then there's a, a you know fairly long stretch before another set of twisties, I can put on the cruise control and just shake out my hand a little bit. And you know any little thing you can do. But I what I learned about when your butt gets sore and this applies to hands too is that just by taking a few minute break and you'll get the blood going again. And it, if you can keep it from getting bad, then it doesn't get so, doesn't get worse. So you, like with your butt, you just get off the bike for a few minutes, you know, and then you get the blood going. What I do on the Tigers, I stand up because I'm on an adventure bike, so I can do that. Uh, okay, here's another one uh, that, uh, that Sharon was asking about. What do you do if your brakes lock up and you are in a skid? There's something about releasing it and reapplying, but it was either for the front wheel or the back wheel. So uh, if you have ABS now, this is less of a concern. Uh, I'll talk more about brakes in another webinar. Uh, but let's say you don't have brakes. The idea is that if you, if you lock your front wheel, it's going to tuck. It's, it, it will do it quickly. You lock that front tire, and it's, you're going to lose all direction control, and your bike will go down pretty quick. So you have to release it immediately and then reapply because you were applying your brakes for some reason to begin with. Uh, now, the MSF s says that when, if you lock the rear brake, that, that um, you should keep it locked. And that's okay, pretty good advice to prevent a high side crash. Now, if you're going kind of slowish and if you're on dirt, you can let go of the brakes and it's not gonna flick you. But if think about it, if you're going this way and, and you're fishtailing, your rear tire is skidding and it's going this way and you let go of that rear brake, it's going to want to get right immediately behind the front wheel because of your forward momentum, your inertia. And that's what could cause you to, it to go like this and then it'll flick you right off as a, in a high side. And that's really dangerous. So that's what they say. However, I've also seen people fishtail and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So I've, when I've ever done that in the past, I've typically been able to time it pretty well that as it's starting to come toward the middle I release right here and then it tends to gather itself up but then again that takes some practice dirt riding is what will really, really uh, gets you to practice and uh, and uh, get familiar with that sort of stuff because you're skidding all the time uh, so there's that oh tire blowouts again these are sort of things that doesn't generally happen not anymore uh, there was something about a death, death wobble. This is a thing, a Harley thing. And I can't really believe that Harley hasn't fixed that if there is such a thing. Uh, I can't help but think that it's um, a combination of, you know, some maintenance issue and rider error, but I don't know. I've not experienced it. I've certainly been in wobbles before and it's been a combination of that. Um, so what to do? If you can, if you're ever in a wobble and in, in stable situation, you actually gas it. Uh, it's the same thing if you were ever towing a, a, a trailer and it starts getting into this sort of thing, you actually want to gas it so that it pulls the, the, the tow vehicle, pulls the trailer in line with the uh, tow vehicle. Uh, and again, me, you might not be able to do that. You'd accelerate right into some, some other problem, but that is a, you know, a, easy to say solution. Uh, okay, let's see, we got, I think maybe one more. Oh, I'm gonna go back to Dick Burdix. He asked me, he says, do you still get excited with a track day coming up or is it a blur because there are so many? Uh, so that relates to this past weekend where we've had th three track days and then two weeks later we had three more track days and I'm at all of them for Tony's track days. Uh, and, you know, we've had a lot of them compressed this year because our beginning of our season was interrupted. So we're making it up through that through the year. 
uh, I still love riding on the racetrack because it's, it's at a very concentrated high level and there I find my limits. I find, I can explore my limits on the racetrack. On the racetrack, on the street, I, I you know, I look for precision. And that's what I l enjoy doing on the, on, the, on, the, on the street and enjoying, of course, the scenery and getting places, seeing new places. But when it comes to skill development and my skill um, growth and what interests me, uh, I would have to go really, really fast on the street to kind of feel as though I you know, was pushing my physical limits. But on the racetrack, I can get there pretty quick, you know, and uh, I'm peer, there are people faster than me and, uh, and I'm trying to always improve my accuracy and, um, and my speed, you know, speed ends up, it's a product of good technique. Um, and so that's what makes it interesting. And I've been doing it for 25 years and actually raced before that. So you add all the, all the years up and it's 30 years on a racetrack and um, way more than most people too. I do about 2000 track miles a year. And, you know, it's still, I just still love it, you know. Um, and it, at the end of it, I still am like ready for another one. So it's good to have breaks between. But yeah, thanks Dick for that. I think I got all my questions here. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna call that a wrap. Let's see, let me read a couple. Alan Robinson, my Goldwing uh, had the death wobble at 40 miles an hour when engine braking. Once the front tire was replaced, it went away. Likely balance or bad wear on the tire. By the way, if there ever is a wobble, it's at 40 miles an hour. It just almost seems universal. Any bike I've ever had that's had a wobble, it's, it's decelerating, particularly like downhill, uh, it'll start just shimmying. It's 40 miles an hour. I don't care what, you know, maybe 43, 40, you know, 38, but it's just always that. And so the tire was, took care of that. Um, so that's, that's just something to keep in mind is that oftentimes, you know, a tire can make a difference. Your tire pressures, uh, steering head bearings. So you make sure that all those things are, are squared away. Yeah, K1200 LT had it terrible. Head shake, steering stabilizers. That's one way to try to um, dampen a, a wobble is a steering stabilizer, add that. But that's usually a, a, a Band-Aid over a more serious problem. But it's not a bad thing to have, believe me. So I have them on the racetrack all the time. All right, let's see, I've got a couple chats here, let's see. All right, Alan, very thankful, thanks. Uh, Rich, WWKS, not sure what that is. Sharon is here with me. You wanna clarify that, Rich? I'm about to sign off, so. All right. So I guess I got everything done. Hopefully that was beneficial to you. We'll do this again sometime. If you want to be a patron, go to my website. There's a donate um, menu item and you can just toss a few bucks. It's always appreciated. Um, and patrons, if you're already a patron, there's a bunch of folks on here I know who are already patrons. I really appreciate it. it again, it helps me to feel appreciated and that um, I'm willing to keep doing this stuff. And I know it helps a lot of people because I get a lot of feedback. And um, it's what I do. It's what I've been doing for years and years, and I'm happy to do it. I do.